Good to have you with us. This is Arirang News. It's 4 p.m. here in Seoul, and I'm Na Hyun Gyeong. We begin with the nation's creative economy drive. Nearly half of Korea's creative economy centers, which aim to help entrepreneurs turn their ideas into businesses, are now open. The latest addition opened in the outskirts of Seoul on this Monday. Officials say the new center will help more local companies branch out overseas. Won Ji Hyun reports. It comes as no surprise that the Pangyo Techno Valley in Gyeonggi-do province is now home to Korea's eighth innovation center aimed at ICT convergence. Nearly half of Korea's IT firms are based in Gyeonggi-do province, and over 70 percent of Korea's online and mobile game exports come from companies in this region. The area, also known as Korea's Silicon Valley, will become a test bed for Korea's burgeoning IoT or Internet of Things industry, which is based on the idea that all objects are connected to the Internet. Students in the Pangyo area will be the first to experience a pilot project that monitors youth obesity through wearable devices. The ICT Innovation Center will also act as a financial technology or fintech hub, with its support center offering one-on-one -on -one mentoring between startups with business ideas and financial consultants, as well as local banking and credit card companies. Located just south of the capital, the branch will function as a hub for companies aiming for foreign markets through MOUs signed with startup support centers in other countries and Korea's Innovation Center overseas branches. These innovation centers will also help local firms exhibit their products at international fairs abroad, like the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas or the annual Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. The centers offer booths set of funds for up to five companies. The government plans to hold an annual Global Investors Fair in the latter half of the year, promoting startups launched through its creative economy drive. Won ji Arirang News. Almost one year has passed since Bank of Korea Governor Lee Ju-yeol took his post last April. Now, he started out strong, receiving a favorable evaluation from the market and political parties. But over the course of his first year, those early good impressions seem to have faded. Our Shin Zemin reports. Bank of Korea Governor Lee Ju-yeol has received some criticism that he could do more to foster communication between financial bodies and the public, and that he has lost the public's trust. That's the exact opposite of what Lee promised to do last year when he took office. A total of three rate cuts also affected this assessment. Lee changed his fiscal policy course from maintaining to slashing the interest rate from 2.5 last August to two and a quarter percent. Last month, rate cut to 1.75 came as a surprise, shocking many market watchers. Snowballing household debt is fueling more dissatisfaction with the BOK governor, as well as the country's continuing feeble economic growth. Despite three cuts to the key rate since Lee took over, fears of rapid deflation still linger, with this month's Consumer Sentiment Index and the Business Sentiment Index both lower than last March, which was right before he took office. Korea's economic growth rate also fell from 1.1 percent in the first quarter of last year to 0.3 percent in the fourth quarter, staying in the 0 percent range. Some pundits point out, however, that the country's dull economic outlook and its discouraging figures cannot be blamed solely on the governor. External factors such as slow global economic recovery on top of tumbling oil prices have also played a role in the economic slump. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Korean manufacturers are feeling slightly more confident about the economy this month, but they still feel uncertain about future prospects. Bank of Korea's March Business Survey Index for the manufacturing sector went up 3 points to 77 from the February reading. Anything below 100 means pessimists outnumber optimists. Now, low oil prices and the weakening local currency against the greenback are pointed as possible reasons behind the rise. But the reading is still below 100, and the outlook for April dropped two points from the previous reading, a, re a reflection of weak economic projections due to sluggish domestic demand. By sector, small and medium-sized firms reported the biggest drop in confidence. 
A widely expected U.S. rate hike and lower global oil prices are hinting at trouble for emerging economies, including Korea. The nation's outbound shipments to other emerging economies have already been on a decline, and experts say this is likely to continue for the, sum, for the time being. Our Kim min -ji has the story. Korean exports to emerging economies took a dive in the first two months of this year, casting a cloud over the nation's economy. According to Statistics Korea on Monday, Korea's exports to 18 emerging economies came to nearly $37 billion in the January to February period, down 6.2 percent from the same period a year earlier. The decline is three times bigger compared to Korea's total exports, which dropped about 2 percent in the cited period. Emerging economies include China, Russia and India. The decline is a concern for Korea as emerging markets make up about half of its exports, accounting for 45.1 percent in 2013. But that figure fell to 43.9 percent last year. Experts say the fall is linked to a widely expected U.S. Federal Reserve rate hike this year. The rate increase could trigger a rush of capital which can weaken currencies and hurt stock markets of emerging economies. This, coupled with a sharp decline in global oil prices, has hurt oil-producing nations, some of which are also emerging economies. Korea's exports to these countries fell 4.4 percent in the first two months of 2015 compared to the previous year. Given these global conditions, experts say Korea's export outlook remains unclear and export growth will likely be in the 1 percent range, down from 2.3 percent last year. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. When it comes to brand recognition, world-famous hotel chains may have an edge in Korea, but when it comes to customer preference, local chains appear to have a competitive edge. For this week's Industry Insights, Song ji -sun looks into the nation's hotel industry and explains what may be behind this. Korea has its fair share of global luxury hotels. But when it comes to selecting a venue for celebrity weddings or hosting VIPs, it's the local chains that shine. In the latest survey on preferred hotel brands, local chains like Shilla and Lotte came out on top over internationally renowned brands. The service standards set by global brands may not necessarily reflect the unique service expectation and culture of the local users. On the other hand, local brands like Shilla and Lotte have spent many years researching the specific needs and preferences of Korean guests and fine-tuning the product to their needs. Domestic hotel chains also have an advantage when it comes to revamping their facilities. They have a proven revenue stream that's separate from the hospitality side of the business. Korean hotels may be better known for hosting VIP guests like foreign leaders and providing venues for celebrity weddings. But the big money doesn't come from room rates or from the high-profile functions. Most of the revenue actually comes from their duty-free businesses. Lotte and Shila dominate the local duty-free market, and they're also expanding overseas to airports in Singapore and Guam. They've also been quick to get a jump on a different segment of the local hotel market. The two domestic chains are building new mid-range and business hotels, catering to visitors seeking budget rooms with quality services. And given that Korea's hotel industry is expanding by the year, especially with the rapid rise in the number of Chinese tourists to Korea, the hotel room supply is expected to fall short of demand, especially in the capital. Experts say these moves to diversify are helping the industry become more resilient, but they also point out that the local chains must prepare for changes in the market, like the recent drop in the number of Japanese tourists to Korea on the back of the weekend. They encourage hotels to devise strategies for attracting visitors from a variety of countries to mitigate the volatility in the industry. Song Ji-sun. Arirang News.
bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Young Young live from Seoul every weekday only on Arirang. Inevitable was how Japan described a formal apology for its historical wrongdoings back in 1984. Now, that historical record comes from documents released by Seoul's Foreign Affairs Ministry on Monday, with Korea-Japan diplomatic ties at one of their lowest points. The documents detail former President Chun Doo-hwan's 1984 trip to Tokyo. In the lead-up to the trip, the main focus of the agenda was whether or not former Japanese Emperor Hirohito would comment on or apologize for, for his country's past. The documents show that Japan agreed that it was, quote, inevitable to comment on its history. Now, in the end, Hirohito expressed regret over the country's colonial rule from 1910 to 1945 and said its historical atrocities should not be repeated. The possible deployment of THAAD, a U.S. missile defense system, to the Korean Peninsula has been causing quite the stir in recent weeks here in Korea. But we may be overlooking a fundamental question now, that is, how well does the system work? Here's Arirang's Kim Yeon bin In flight testing, THAAD's hit rate is as impressive as it gets. Tested 10 tons between 2007 and 2013. The U.S. missile defense system has a track record of 100 percent mission success. However, that hasn't stopped some defense experts in the U.S. questioning how reliable it really is. In a report submitted to the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee last week, the Pentagon's director of operational test and evaluation, Michael Gilmore, said the system has not shown steady progress in its ability to shoot down ballistic missiles in their terminal phase point to examples where the system has some glitches and poor weather conditions during tests. Gilmore stressed that it was important to fix the problems at hand, as that is supposed to be able to work at any time. He also highlighted the need for better training programs for troops who operate and maintain THAAD. The defense official noted that simulators used to train soldiers how to use THAAD are not a completely accurate representation of how the system works in real life, which could lead to errors when intercepting missiles. That has been a hot topic of debate in Korea, as the U.S. has been pushing to deploy the system to South Korea, saying it will better protect the country against North Korea's ballistic missile threats. Both governments say, however, that the issue has not been formally discussed. But with U.S. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter scheduled to visit Seoul early next month, watchers speculate that could be on the official agenda. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. Now to the latest on the German wing's plane investigation. The impact of the crash left not a single body intact, so experts are relying on DNA to identify the passengers and crew. Recovery teams are also looking for the second black box. Kwon Soa has the details. Forensic teams have made progress in their examination of hundreds of body parts located at the German wing's crash site in the French Alps and have so far identified the DNA strands of 78 victims. Experts say DNA samples from relatives as well as dental records, fingerprints and accessories have helped the process. The search for the second black box is still ongoing, shown in this on-site footage recently released by France's Interior Ministry. The digital flight data recorder, which is made of electronic components and records all the data from the flight, is very important for the rest of the investigation. Experts say that if the 10-kilogram black box has not been completely pulverized or destroyed in any other way, it will be buried under rubble and debris. A road is being built to give all-terrain vehicles access to the remote site to help the removal of large parts of the plane. It could be completed by Monday night local time. German media has been reporting on the black box recording of the final terrifying minutes of the ill-fated flight. Co-pilot Andreas Lubitz, who is assumed to have purposely crashed the plane, tells Captain Patrick Sontheimer that he can go to the toilet at any time. When the captain does step outside, the sound of Lubitz locking the cockpit door can be heard. 
Shortly after, there's a bang, and Captain Zontaima is heard shouting, for God's sake, open the door, amid the screams of petrified passengers. This as reports surfaced over the weekend that said Lubitz may have not been fit to fly last Tuesday, possibly suffering from a detached retina. They also cited investigators as saying that he was treated by several neurologists and psychiatrists and that a number of prescribed drugs were found at his apartment, suggesting the 27-year-old was a deeply troubled man. Konsoa, Arirang News. And with the likelihood that the co-pilot crashed the plane on purpose, the debate over pilotless planes has resurfaced. Here's Lee Ji Young with more. Speculation that a 27-year-old co-pilot intentionally crashed a plane had led some to question whether planes might be safer without pilots. Advocates of the idea say that if planes were fully automated, the tragedy of German Wings Flight 9525 could have been averted. The co-pilot has reportedly prevented the captain from re-entering the cockpit after he'd left, before sending the plane into a descent that led to the crash. The disaster has already led to calls in Europe for a rule requiring that two pilots be in the cockpit at all times. Self-flying aircraft that can be controlled from the ground are not entirely new. Drones have been used for military missions for years. The U.S. military flies Global Hawk drones nearly the size of a Boeing 737 passenger jet. And Boeing says it's developed fully automated planes to prevent hijackings. But barriers remain to get the technology off the ground. For one, insurers are likely to cover commercial planes that fly without pilots due to the potential unreliability involved. Then there are labor unions, which are concerned that self-flying planes would leave pilots without jobs. Critics also say self-flying aircraft had their own problems, including an increased vulnerability to hacking. Lee ji Arirang News. Tough choices still lie ahead for Iran and the six world powers trying to reach a deal before time runs out in less than 48 hours. Tehran and the U.S., China, Russia, the U.K., France and Germany have been locked in talks in Switzerland to reach a deal that would curb Iran's nuclear activities and also roll back crippling economic sanctions. Among the main sticking points is how long Iran would be required to cap its nuclear program. Now, world World powers want to progressively remove the uranium enrichment program after the 10-year commitment, while Tehran wants the cap removed completely thereafter. Tuesday is the self-imposed deadline to agree on a framework, while a comprehensive deal is aimed for by June. Scientists from Korea and the U.S. have released some promising new research for the treatment of autoimmune disorders. The research focuses on a particular type of white blood cells called T-cells. Our Son Jung-in tells us more. A team of core researchers from the Korea Research Institute of Bioscience and Biotechnology and Harvard Medical School believes that regulatory T cells formed right after birth may be the key to suppressing autoimmune disorders. Regulatory T cells in a newborn baby are much more effective in tackling autoimmunity or metabolic disease. This new discovery could be the key in developing treatment for cell disorders. The researchers confirmed that newborn T cells are much more effective than T cells produced in adulthood. Regulatory T cells are suppressive cells that are essential to modulate the immune system. A deficiency of these cells can lead to the development of autoimmune disorders where the body attacks its own cells and tissues, for example, type 1 diabetes or thyroid disease. The researchers experimented on mice with organs damaged by an autoimmune disorder. Mice injected with newborn regulatory T cells showed significant recovery, whereas mice injected with adult regulatory T cells showed no signs of improvement. They also found that regulatory T cells from newborns had more vitality and movement, reflecting higher suppression abilities in the autoimmune system. The team anticipates this discovery will serve as a turning point for the development of cell disorder treatments and may also advance research on anti-aging medicine. The results of the study were featured in the March issue of the medical journal Science. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. 
While Korea, China, and Japan may have many political disagreements, a new exhibit is bringing artists from these countries together for a united approach to art. It's titled The Subtle Triangle. Our Im Yun Hee takes us there. This might look like just another grocery shop, with fully stocked shelves ready for shoppers. There are even customers and staff. But all of this is part of Shanghai Supermarket, an installation art piece by Chinese artist Xu Zhen. He's recreated a life-size market, but all of the boxes, bags and cans, they're empty, already consumed by the artist. This isn't about whether we see this as a piece of art or not, but rather that the products are purchased and even taken home. The artist wants the experience to continue outside the gallery. Drowned in glowing screens, Japanese artist Koizumi Mero creates a video work titled Theater Dreams, where he explores human emotions and our response to historical events. Living abroad gave me good, like, gave me a kind of objective view towards Japan. So after I came back to Japan, I could see the Japan more objectively. And that's kind of starting point of what I'm doing now. Also for the exhibition, Korean artist Yang Achi unveils his new experimental project, Sea Salt Theater, where he looks at some geographical elements of Asia. I hope people have a range of experiences here. You're listening to the audio aspect, but you can also experience the sense of touch and even smell. But there's more to see than these three works of art. The exhibition also offers an examination of art history within Asia, paying close attention to cultural exchanges between the three countries since 1989. Im Yun Hee, Arirang News. Now things will be looking a little bit different at Arirang TV next week. The station has announced a new schedule that emphasizes interactive communication with viewers. Our Kim ji reports. Korea's one and only fully English broadcasting system, Arirang TV, announced its new lineup for 2015. The new programs will launch next Monday, April 6. Arirang TV's president and CEO, Pang seok says one of the big differences is that more programs will invite viewers to interact with shows in real time. Broadcasting is no longer a communication channel that's one-sided. Arirang TV will do its best to deliver various Korean cultural content and further interact with our viewers in 130 million households in more than 100 countries. Foreign panelists will play a big role on two new programs. Hosted by Shin ha Young, Bring It On will give viewers the opportunity to share their opinions with the panel through social networking sites and YouTube. The one-hour program will air every Thursday, 9 a.m. Korea time. Shooters, hosted by Na Sing Yeon, features a multinational group of expats debating the latest social and cultural issues every Friday, 7 a.m. Korea time. Arirang TV is planning to enter the United Nations in House Network this July as an English-based 24-hour news channel alongside CNN International, BBC World and NHK World. Kim Jung, IDEA News. Welcome back. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. We begin the week with yellow dust blanketing the nation and currently the level is at 141 micrograms per cubic meter here in Seoul and Gangwon-do at 156 while Chungcheong-do is at 170. Now Busan is also looking fine at the moment however there are going to be ups and downs so make sure to keep an eye on the readings throughout the day. Now temperatures are on the warm side today. The nation will be experiencing unseasonably warm conditions during the day uh, with most of the regions where you see in orange uh, are hovering up in the 20s, roughly 8 to 9 degrees higher than the seasonal average. Now, along with that, we'll be under partly cloudy skies today and starting tomorrow night, rain is expected to fall nationwide. Well, now, with that in mind, let's have a look at the readings for today. Seoul will be lingering around 20 this afternoon, meanwhile the southern regions such as Gwangju and Busan will top to 24 and 19 degrees. Moving over to other regions, Jeju Island gets up to 19, Tokdo hits to 17, while Mount Kungang is a bit cloudy at 11 degrees. Well, that's all for now, Michelle Park, and I hope you have a wonderful day.
Now that brings us to the end of our newscast. I'm Nahyun Gyeong in Seoul. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with all of that and more at 6 p.m. Korea time.